Hello and welcome on this Juneteenth day. We wish you a happy Juneteenth and we thank you for attending this webinar, the sixth in our Awaken Your Potential Leadership series, 10 Ways to Unlock Greatness. I'm your moderator, Jenny Alton from the New York Small Business Development Center Central Office. Our specific topic today is learn, earn, and return. And your presenter, of course, we are welcoming back the wonderful Chad Reyes, author and renowned coach of Lions Pride Leadership. This webinar is brought to you by the New York Small Business Development Center Network of 20 campus-based centers and many more regional outreach offices located across New York State, along with the central office based in Albany. The NYSBDC is a U.S. Small Business Administration resource partner. Our free advising, education, research, and advocacy services are made possible by funding from the SBA, New York State, and our host campuses. So you know we are recording today. We will share a link to the recording with attendees in the next few days in a follow-up email. Attendees are muted and will not appear on camera. Your chats will only be visible to me, our presenter, and our behind-the-scenes helpers. If you have any questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to type them in the Q&A box as they come up. You can open Zoom's Q&A box from the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will save questions for a Q&A session at the end of the presentation to make sure Chad can get through all of his material first today. And now, Chad, the time is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Uh, just I, I love spending time with you and your team and, and the people in the SBDC network. And uh, we're, we're going to get started. We'll watch this sh short little video and then we'll jump on in. You have to be awakened that there's more inside of you. You have to be awakened that there's more potential in you. All you need to do is make a decision. This is going to happen. And all of a sudden, things start changing in your life. That's why great commitments precede great achievement. You got to commit to achieve. It's the same thing with athletes. The greatest athletes are able to tap into their mind, to push their mind beyond what their body thinks is possible. Awakening your potential is the key to everything you and I want in our lives. Everything you dreamed of, everything that you say you want is in you awakening your potential. You have potential, I have potential, and let's awaken ourselves to that potential. Wow, so I, I'm really excited to be with you guys today, especially on this topic. I know we've been we've been going through a series of, of different lessons that is in uh, my book, Awaken Your Potential, and T today is a topic, learn, earn, and return. And it's a it's a topic that had that I personally had struggled through, if I can be real with you. Um, I personally really struggled through, you know, coming right out of college and jumping into business, you you, you automatically think that the the you just need to start earning and not realizing that there's a phase. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today is the, the whole phase of learn, earn, and return. And I, I want to I wanna kind of just share a couple of quotes and then we'll, we'll jump on in. I, I, I love when John Maxwell says this. He says that we overestimate what we can accomplish in a day and we underestimate what we can accomplish in a lifetime. Now, just think about that for a moment. Many, many years ago when I first came out of college... I, I would stay up till three in the morning trying to work, get things done, move things forward. And then I'd wake up at six and I'd do it again. And I, I don't think that, I think that most people, because they don't have a, a, a this phase approach, they work so hard for short periods of time. And, and, I, and I would just say that they, they miss the point that consistency compounds over time. I wish I would have learned that earlier when I first came right out of college. And I'm, I'm going to share with you today about some of my personal story around it, but uh, things that I've learned and, and things that we, we share with other leaders, because what it does is it allows people to really be able to take 
a little bit of that pressure off and say, wow, this is, there's a phased approach to being impactful and intentional and successful. So uh, I'm going to share more about that today. And, and the, you know, right here is some, something that I think is so powerful where, you know, it says when we have momentum, we look better than we are. And when we don't have momentum, we look worse than we are. The truth is we really aren't really that good or really that bad. Momentum is the great exaggerator. If, if you think about it for a moment, in anything in your life, when you had momentum, you looked better than you were. When you had momentum, people were like, wow, look how good you are. But when you didn't have momentum, and I've been there where th there's no momentum, all of a sudden it's like, wow, you're really not that good. Wow, things have fallen apart. Now, the truth of it is, is that it's you're really not that good and you're really not that bad. It's just that you had momentum on your side. I, I, I don't know about you. Uh, my wife and I, we travel a lot in speaking. And one of the things that you, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but if you look at your, your ticket on your plane, you, you'll see that sometimes going is like an hour shorter than when you're coming back from a flight or vice versa, depending on where you're traveling from. What that is, is momentum. Because in certain, when you're traveling, the plane has more air pushing it, more wind, more thrust behind it that gets you there quicker. And then there's times when you're going into the wind and, and, and yet it's working harder to get there. It takes a little bit longer. You see, that's momentum. Momentum will help exaggerate in a good way or in a bad way. And I, I just want to I want to jump into this today because, you know, as as I was preparing to share with you today, I was thinking about like what are these phases, and and I'll just share it for me is my my, and my phases was when I graduated from college around twenty one, twenty two. That, that was my learn phase, but I, I didn't I didn't pick this up well. I, I wish I could tell you right now that I understood this coming out of college, but I didn't. It, it really wasn't until the last six to eight years that I really started to understand the power of building, taking an approach to phases. Now, you, 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 I don't know where you are. You may be in the learn phase, the earn phase, and the return phase. But what I can tell you is this. There are times where all three phases become one, where you're learning, you're earning, and you're returning. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack it a little bit and share with you a little bit about it. But, uh, but just to give some context here is that a lot of the times when we're in our learn phase, when we're in the earlier part of our career, we think we should be making more money than we actually are. Because there's a false, false sense of expectation. And, and what I want to say is if if someone's in there, if someone on the on this webinar is in the earlier part of your career, my friend, learn. This, this, is, this is a phase where you're being paid to learn. Think about that for a moment. You're, you're getting paid to learn. Absorb it. Take it all in. And there'll be a season where you go into, where you go from learning all the things that you've learned to now you move into a phase of earning. And, and, I, and I will say that for me, that, that, that started in my early 40s where now you start going into like the things that you've learned and the things that you've the, the struggles you've been through, it starts building up. Um, it, it builds up this stability that, that now allows you to go into this earn phase of your life. Now, I, I do want to share that these phases, they, they come together. They, they're not phases that you, you, you could be in all three of them at one time. But typically when you're first starting out in your career, if we, if, I wish I would have... I wish I could have said to my younger self, hey, Chad, just right now, just be in the learn phase. Don't, don't stress about trying to earn. Just, just learn. Learn as much as you can. Get around some good mentors. Really learn, 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 because the earn phase would have happened even sooner. 
I wish I could have gone back and tell myself that when I first graduated from college. And but then but then we'll share now this earn phase where this is this is the season where all the hard work, all of the learning starts now showing up is you start making some more money potentially. You you, you start earning more. And I, I've recognized this. There are some people that are in their that are in their learn phase and they're trying to be in their earn phase. And because of it, there's this tension. I don't know if you've ever been there. I know I have, but there's that tension. And as leaders, the reason why I wrote this chapter is because I recognize that leaders struggle through this. But then we move into the return phase. And, I, and I'll share this, the return phase is where we start teaching what we've learned to others. I, I, I'm, my wife and I are blessed to be able to be in all three phases of this at the same time right now. I'm learning. I'm constantly learning. If you if you were around me on a daily basis, you, you, you'd see that I'm I'm constantly reading. I'm constantly asking people to help me. I'm 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 getting mentor time with mentors of mine. I'm challenging the process of how we do things. So I'm always learning, but I'm also in a season where we're we're earning. But then I also have people that I'm returning and investing and mentoring. So today. I'm going to give you some I'm going to give you some language I'm going to give you some leadership principles that you can use in these different phases but I I wanted to share that these three phases are so important and they're important because if you don't recognize that there are these three phases it can be very overwhelming because you're trying to accomplish it we you know I shared that the quote earlier from John where we overestimate what we could get done in a day and we underestimate what we can accomplish in a career or a lifetime. And my friend, when, when we're able to really put it in context and say, hey, there's learn, earn, and return. There's going to be seasons where I'm just in learn. There's going to be seasons where I'm in learn and earn. Some seasons where I'm in earn and return. But if we know the seasons we're in, it will make it so much easier to get through those seasons. And I, I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what season you're in, but I just encourage you to embrace these three phases. So let, let's jump on in and, and let's, uh, let's look at these a little bit further. So let, let's talk about the learn phase for a moment. And I wanna give you in the learn phase, I wanna give you these, these five things. We call them fishes. In the book, I, I go through it in depth, but it's fishes, F-I-S-H-S. -S. Financial capital, intellectual capital, social capital, human capital, and spiritual capital. I, I A lot of people don't spend enough time in their learning years, or even the learning years that, that go into later years of life. Because I, I believe that we're lifelong learners. I believe that I don't care if I'm 90 years old, I'm going to be learning. I, I, I'll tell you this. I, the doctor could say I have an hour left, and I'm still going to try to figure out how to learn. I just, I'm a big advocate of learning. And one of the things I'd encourage people is learn some skill sets in finances, in the financial er uh, world. And the reason is, is that you can't avoid it. You could say, I don't like finances. I don't like dealing with them. But the truth of it is, is that you're going to have to, at some point, deal with it. So the better you learn in that, or in that air, area, the, the greater you can find mentors that will help you in that area, books to read that will help you in that area. It'll, make, it, it'll help your earning years and your returning years be more productive, more intentional. So, so I, I'd encourage you on that. In, intellectual is, what books are you reading? What books are you reading? What podcasts are you listening to? What, do, the, do the books you read and the podcasts you listen to, do they lead you towards what you're trying to accomplish in your lifetime? You know, on, pre on a previous um, webinar with you, uh, I shared that I really only read three types of books. I, I read books that have to do with 
leadership, books that have to do with business, and books that have to do with my faith. Now, I, I, I listen to other things. I, I take insight and input from others, but, but I know that those are the three areas that are going to give me the greatest return. And then, and then what, what is, how do I develop my, my knowledge base so that I can become more valuable in my earn years? You see, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like so many people want to be paid more, but they haven't created more value. They, for the business owners that are on here, think about it. You want your clients to pay you, maybe even pay you more. But how are you developing yourself? How are you growing your team so that you are more valuable to the marketplace? That's part of the learn phase. And then social. So social is the, the relationships that you have in your networks. How are you learning to add value to them? I, I have these two questions that I always say. The people in your network, what do they find val valuable? And then how do you add value to them? That's the question. What do they find valuable and how can you add value to them? When you can figure that out, all of a sudden now, as you're learning through your social network, you're going to see that it's going to, it's going to bring tremendous opportunity as you move into the next phase of earn. Your human capital, your leadership ability, your, your ability to raise your leadership lid. You know, in a previous session, I shared about the, the, the lore of the lid, where everything in our life will be literally coming flush against a lid. How do we raise that lid so that earning potential becomes greater because we've learned how to raise our lid? And one of the things I, I say there is, is, is understanding what your emotional intelligence is, understanding, you know, how do you handle stress? How do you make better decisions? How do you express yourself? How do you perceive yourself? These are areas that in, in the human capital side of learning, if you can learn these things, it'll help you be more effective to earn and return. And then spiritual. And spiritual doesn't have to do with faith. Spiritual has to do with traditions that you've built into your life. How do you learn how to do that so that you can continue to make an impact in other people's lives? You know, I, I just give you an example. Yesterday, j just yesterday, I, I had a dinner meeting that I was planning to go a little bit later. And my wife um, texted me and said, uh, babe, we just got an invitation for our niece's graduation uh, dinner. Um, that just the family's getting together. It was like a last minute thing. That was part of my spiritual capital. I, I, I moved things around. I ended my dinner a little bit earlier. Why? Because... I want, I want my nieces and nephews, which I have, my wife and I have a lot of them. We actually have two baseball teams plus two replacement players. You do the numbers, nine plus nine plus two. 20 nieces and nephews we have. But I, I say all that to say is that in, in the spiritual capital, it's traditions. And I, and I want that to be a tradition that the family sees that my uncle, who's, listen, he's very big into business, very big into leadership, but my uncle shows up for things. The, the Friday before that, it was my niece's graduation. We were there, my wife and I, left a little bit early. But these are, these are things that fall under traditions that I would like to see my nieces and my nephews and eventually our kids perpetuate. But we, we have to learn that. And, and I use this methodology of fishes because it helps us be able to contextualize it. So uh, I'll, I'll walk us into the next part here. Screen. There you go. So, so I want to give you 10 ways that you can maximize your earning potential. These are 10 ways that you can practically maximize your ability to earn. So, so if you're if you're hoping that you want you want your company to grow and you want to make more money, or you personally work at a company and you want to be able to make more money, these are ten things to maximize your earning potential. So don't, don't miss this part of it because it, it, this is real dollars and cents. You ready? Here's the first one. 
as leaders, we need to identify leaders. We need to know what they look like. We, we, need, to, we need to be able to find them so that we can develop them. I, I'll, I'll tell you this. In your earning years, if you have leaders that you're investing in and developing, you'll earn more and they'll earn more if you can find them and develop them. I, I know too many leaders that invest in people, which is phenomenal, but they're not getting a return on it because th those people are not developing more people. They're not able, they, they don't have a high leadership lid. And our job as leaders is to be able to raise people's lids so that they can reach more potential. So in our earning years, we, we need to identify leaders. We need to know what the leaders look like. So when we see them, we can say, hey, listen, I want to invest in you. I want to develop you. I want to grow you. I want to spend more time with you. The, the, the next one is this. We got to attract leaders. One of the ways to maximize earning potential is your business your division, the area that you're responsible. You got to attract more leaders. More leaders got to say, I, I, I want what you're doing over there. I, I don't know what you're doing, but I, I know that I want that. You know, one, one of the things that, I, that I, I can tell you is there's not an organization in the world that says, I don't want more leaders. Because more leaders allows you to reach more people. More leaders allows you to have more clients. More leaders allows you to make more money. So if you work for a company, become a greater leader. You become more valuable to the company. If you own the company, develop your team to be leaders so they become more valuable. Because if they become more valuable, they'll be able to add value to your clients. Let me give you the, let me give you the third one. Understand leaders. I wish I would have done this better because what, what I didn't realize earlier in my career is I led from my head instead of my heart. Now I try to connect both of them. I try, I try to lead from my head and my heart instead of my head or my heart. As, as a leader, it's so key that we understand the leader's and we're able to, the people that were around, and we're able to connect with them. Let me give you the next one. Motivate leaders. You know, I, I'll share this. I was just, probably two weeks ago, I was speaking at uh, an organization, a top 100 accounting firm. And we were, we were at their partner summit, so they brought all their partners together in their C-suite. And... I was the, the keynote speaker for the event, and I said something from the stage. I was teaching on some of the principles that were, that's in this book, and I said something from the stage. I said, I said to the partners there, I said, understand this, that the firm, while the firm would love for you to produce more, would love for you to be more effective, understand this. Your children and your family and your spouse, they deserve for you to reach your potential. The byproduct is, is that accounting firm will benefit. But your family deserves you, deserves for you to give your best. And that's what it comes with motivating leaders. It's encouraging them to give their best. Not because the company deserves it, because they deserve it. I, I, you know, yes, my wife and I, we own multiple companies. And yes, I give my best. But I don't give my best because I'm hoping to get a financial return. I give my best because I deserve to give my best. I want to go to bed every night saying, hey, Chad gave his best. So many people I know and leaders I know, they go to bed and they didn't give their best that day. They knew that they had more inside of them. But they said, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna give my that, my company my best. Not realizing that they rob themselves when they don't give their best. My friend, whether you own the company or work at a company, give your best. That's what motivating leaders does. It allows you to earn more. It allows them to earn more, and it helps them not rob themselves. Let me get, let's go to the next one. Equip leaders. 
one of the things we, we have to do is we have to train them. We got we to gotta help them develop the skill sets that they need to be more effective at the work that we're asking them to do. I'm, I tell you this, on all of these, I'm not perfect at them. Our company doesn't perfect them, but we're aware of them. We're trying, we're working, we're tweaking. You don't need to be perfect, but we need to progress. And I'm just highlighting the areas to focus in so that you could have maximizing earning potential. Because when we equip people and they have the skill sets, they're able to do their job better. I, I, my, my wife and I, we say this, and, and Lion's Pride is based on this motto, awaken, empower, equip. We want to awaken people to their potential. We want to empower them to reach that potential. And then we want to equip them with the tools that they need to fulfill that potential. The greatest way to earn more is to equip people. We want to empower them. We want to release them to reach that potential. We want, we want to encourage them. Hey, you can do it. You, you have the potential. You, you can do it. We want to empower them. Sometimes empowering will look a little bit different to every person, but we want to release them to their potential. Another way to maximize our earning years is position leaders. Position leaders doesn't mean position against. That's not what I'm saying. Position leaders. I'll give you an example. If you have two people on your team that if they work better together, it becomes more valuable for them and for your clients and for the company. Position leaders so that you can help them multiply impact because they're able to work together more effectively. M mentor leaders. Help, help coach them to get to the next level. You, how, do you, how do we mentor leaders? One of the things that I say all the time is I say, if you show me these two things, I will know what's important to you. Don't, don't miss this part. If you show me two things in a leader's life, I will know what's important to them. The first is their checkbook. If you show me your checkbook, I know what's important. The second is show me your calendar. With those two things, I will always understand the heart of a leader because their checkbook will put money behind things that's important, hence developing people, growing people, mentoring people, helping them become greater, which helps them earn more, helps you earn more, helps the company grow. And then the calendar. Because if, if it doesn't make it into your calendar, then how can you develop people and mentor them? So in your earning years, mentoring leaders is going to be so important to be able to multiply the impact and be able to grow people's capacity. Because mentorship is helping people to get to where you are because you've gone a little bit further than they are. Let's look at the next one. Reproduce leaders. Show them how to develop leaders. Show, show them a process to do this. And then the last one is compound leaders. This is the greatest return of a leader. I, I want to encourage you. In, in, my, in my book, chapter eight, it talks about this. But if, if you want to go from high level to really deep, that's John Maxwell's book, The Leader's Greatest Return. I, the parts that are here are from his book. So I'd encourage you to go in that book and look because it will talk about these 10 areas and how to get the greatest return. Because the greater we can do those 10 areas, guess what happens? Our earning potential goes up. Our fulfillment goes up. We become, we become more fulfilled in what we're doing, which in turn allows us to produce better results. And the last is, uh, I want to share with you this process. If there's anything that you're going to take away from today, take, take this one thing. There's a five-step process to mentoring. I talk about it in the book. The step one is I do it. So many of you are in that process right now. I do it. And when I do it, you, if you constantly are always doing it, it's great. Maybe you're a high producer. You make things happen. But understand that you're only producing for one person. But then when you move to step two is I do it 
and someone's next to me. Person B is next to me. Well, guess what? I'm doing it and now they're observing. They're spending time seeing what I'm doing. That's step two. S step three is, now I say this all the time, that step three is the most expensive, hardest, most difficult step. Step three is where they do it and I'm next to them. Think about that for a moment. I can do it better than them, but I'm sitting next to them. That's the compounding effect of leadership. Because in step three, you're coaching, you're mentoring, you're doing something I call deep learning, where you're going in and saying, hey, if you did this a little bit different, um, hey, why do you think I said what I said? That process is a deep learning process that now, if you do that process well, and by the way, it's costly. It's very costly for me to sit next to someone to do that process. But if I do it well, I then graduate to the step four. And in step four, they do it. You know what's so powerful about that? If you've done the steps correctly, we've, we've given ourselves the ability to earn them. What we've also done is we've equipped someone to be able to do it without needing you. We've now allowed us to multiply. But step five is the most important part. If you really want to have an organization that's going to really grow, a lot of people can do step one, two, three, and four well. Step five is the most important part because step five is now that person does it. And now they walk that person through the same process that you walk that person through. So when you do that now, now we have a multiplication where we can start multiplying leaders because we expect every leader to start doing that. And then let, 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 me, let me just give you a little bit on return and we're going to open up uh, for some Q&A. In, in, in the return, it's a very simple thing. What you learned in financial, intellectual, social, human, and spiritual, what you learned as a leader, just return it. Invest in other leaders. Invest in more people. Develop them. Mentor them. That's the return phase. I, my, my wife and I, I'm, I'm so happy to say that we, we get the ability to do that with students in the Department of Education. They use our leadership curriculum. We have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students using our curriculum. You know how amazing that is? Uh, my wife and I are already in our return phase while we're in our learn phase and our earn phase. My friend, don't rob yourself of what's possible. Understand the phases. Understand that you could be operating in all three phases. But you got to develop the leadership capacity so that if you are in the earn phase and you want to make more, making more requires you to do those 10 things really well. So I'll share this and then Jenny, we're going to we'll open it up for some q and I'll share this. Just understand this. Success is all about you. Significance is about others. When, when we go from our learn and earn to return, return brings us into significance because we're able to invest and develop more people and more leaders. And I want you to just remember this. And most people don't even remember this. There's a difference between success and significance. There's a huge difference. Walk yourself through those three phases Understand where you are in those three phases. And, and remember that consistency will compound. If you, if you consistently learn and you apply it and you consistently use those 10 areas and you apply it, it will compound over time. Your impact, your influence, your ability to earn will go up through the roof. And my friend, I, I hope that what I shared with you today was, was helpful, applicable. And I, I know I struggled through it for many years. I thank God I'm not struggling through it anymore. But, I, but, but it, it doesn't mean it's easy. You have to be intentional. That's the difference between good leaders and great leaders. Great leaders are highly intentional of how they develop themselves. 
So, uh, so Jenny, I know we're going to open up for some Q and A now. Yes. Thank you. And um, if you want to show the survey slide, oh, okay. that would be fantastic. So we make sure people have a chance no, to do that. So uh, if you are interested, have not done it yet, Chad is offering a free chapter of his book. If you would like to avail yourself of that, it is the QR code is there and I am putting the link into the chat right now as well. And uh, you can also just give feedback on today's session directly to chat through this uh, QR code and link that I've just dropped in the chat as well. Yeah, thank you, Jenny. So, yes. Now, uh, so our first question here, and I think this is a really great question because uh, I have a definitely, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely one where your mind goes once you've seen these phases. So how do you know at what point you are ready to go from one phase to the next, learn to earn or earn to return? You mentioned that they can all overlap, but is there a specific point where you truly move from one to the next? Yeah, I, I would say this, that I would be more concerned in being aware of where you are than how you move from one to the next. So I'll give you an example of what I mean. The, the, there's seasons where you'll come into, let, I, let's just give an example. Let's say you move to a new career as an example. Well, you, maybe you were in your earning phase in one of your careers, in the previous career, but now you're in a new career. You're really in a learn phase again. So if you're aware that you're in the learn phase, it eventually will take you back into the earn phase. One second. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a tickle in my throat. So I, I think the ability to understand the phase that you're in becomes really important. It's kind of like, um, I don't know about you, Jenny, but if you haven't been to the mall, you know like where it has like the pin drop and it says you are here? That pin drop, the reason why that's so powerful is that pin drop gives you context. It kind of tells you, okay, I'm here. So now knowing that I'm here, everything around me, I can kind of understand how to navigate because I know what's around me now because I know where I am. That's the power of understanding those phases. So if we, if we understand that we're in a season right now, regardless of age, we're in a season that we're really more in learning than earning, it helps them realize, okay, well, then I'm going to use this time to learn as much as possible and to develop myself. So when I move from this phase to the earn phase, I'm more valuable. I, I, I see too often, especially in younger generation, they want to go to earn phase and they think they're more valuable financially than they really are. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. What I'm saying is, is that in the younger, in, when we're younger, we need to develop the skill sets that make us so valuable to organizations so that when we move to the earn phase, they have no other choice but to pay us more money. But the context of understanding where we are, it's almost like the you are here drop. You are here so you could see then and understand perspective. A very good question. Yeah, so our just to kind of dig a little bit deeper with that answer that you gave, so if somebody were in the learn phase and they've been focusing on that, they've really been working on it, are is the earn phase going to kind of naturally start to to happen then once they have built up that skill set, you know, done done the work in the learn phase? Is that something yeah. that it's going to start to happen naturally then? Yeah, so I, I love the way that you're 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 sharing it because if if you think about it for a moment, if we're learning, and we're applying what we're learning, we will naturally grow into earning. So, so I'll give you an example. When, when we look at people that are on the team, let, let's just say you're a business owner and you have a person on your team, people that are learning and developing and growing themselves and applying it and making an impact, eventually they just eventually start making more opportunities financially in the company. So it doesn't mean it doesn't. It's not like well, we just we walk out of the learn door, the earn, uh, learn door, and now we go into the earn door. It's like a progression that kind of happens naturally and organically. 
but it's because they've grown so much and they apply it that they now just become more valuable. Not valuable as a person, valuable as a competency, the ability to add value to the business model. And I, and I, I think that, I think it's, it's, it's not a door that you walk through as much as you grit, you graduate, you kind of, there's a gradient that happens over periods of time where if you're really learning and you're, you're applying it, you, you, you'll naturally just see that, that, that goes up. So then, then looking at the earn to return phase and the natural progression that happens there, what, what does that look like as, as you you know, start to see the opportunities open up for the return phase. Ah, so, so I think sometimes where um, I, I would I would say to people that ask me this question that find out the things that matter to you. My wife and I have a huge heart for the next generation. We have a huge heart for teenagers and youth in schools um, for them to really lead well and develop themselves. So our return phase, a lot of it financial resources, the wisdom that we have, our relationships, a lot of it goes towards that area because we have such a heart for the next generation. One of the things I'd say when it comes to return is what are the things that what are the things that matter to you at a heart level? So so I, I have a person I'm thinking about right now, they their heart is for um, for the senior generation, for those that, um, don't necessarily have people around them as they get older. They have a big heart for that. Well, their return phase could maybe be investing in that generation, going to uh, going to um, to senior centers, um, doing things with them, bringing younger younger uh, younger teenagers from high school, bring them to these centers to build generational relationships where people can say, oh, wow, look, they're investing in that generation. I would say the first thing we need to be aware of is what is the thing that matters to us? Because the return phase is investing in the things that matter to us so that we can see, we can see that get better. And that changes, you know, your, what's, what's important to Jenny is very, very, maybe different than what's important to Chad or Danielle, and then what's important to someone else on this call. So becoming clear on that, because that's an opportunity when we're clear on that, of how then we can return and help make a, a, better, a better difference in those lives of those people. Thank you. And I want to remind everyone that you are welcome to drop your questions in the Q&A box. You can open that from the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. All right. So something, since we focus on small business owners and we here at the NYSBDC, we love being a part of this learn and earn and return process. We very much help people learn so that they can earn and then be able to return to their communities. Um, and so something that stood out to me is you talked about that mentoring process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as companies grow, they will bring on more employees. And so what are some best practices for small businesses? Obviously, you know, Time is a big factor with uh, bringing people on and training them. What are some best practices that small business owners can employ to bring people on in a way that is going to promote, you know, like your your mentorship process that you that you talked about, that is going to promote, uh, you know, leadership growth? Can you can you speak to that some? Yeah. Yeah, th there's one thing that we talk about. I was, it's funny, I was on phone with one of our coaches at Lions Pride Leadership earlier, and we were talking about this one thing I'm going to share. We call it the business model alignment. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that when you think of alignment, it means things are in order, the, the things are in the proper order. And businesses, I think it's very hard for them to go through that process, learn, earn, and return without having clarity of this. So what, what we call it is, is the business model alignment and its purpose, vision, values, giftedness, strategy, and metrics. So I'll, I'll kind of talk through each one. The purpose is why does that, the, the business has to become very clear on why that business exists. And it can't be to make money. 
only. Not saying that the business doesn't exist. We want businesses to be financially thriving, but it can't only be the reason is to make money because you can make money doing anything. So why does that business truly exist? That's the, the purpose. The vision is, where is that business going? What, what is the vision? Is it a vision to have three locations, two locations? Is the vision to have the profits eventually build a real estate portfolio? What is the vision for that? What are the values that we're going to use to drive all of our decision making? And now we move into the second piece, which is giftedness. What is the strengths of the team members to help that purpose, vision, and values come to fruition? Because a lot of a lot of smaller businesses are not using strengths. And I, I know why, because in a small business, you you have so many things pulling at you. But being able to really build a business model based on strengths is so key. One of the ways that we do that, Jenny, and we're, we're not a global company yet. I mean, we have global reach, but we're not a global company, right? One of the ways that we do that is we will bring on we'll bring on uh, consultants to come in that have strengths in areas that we don't have strengths on the team. So recently we built out a team and. We, we knew that we didn't have necessarily the in-house expertise, so we had to go out, out, outside and bring in consultants or bring in independent contractors to help bring their skill set to the table so that they can help us grow. So I think giftedness is so key. And then the, the next part is strategy. What, it, what is the intentional game plan of how we're going to get there? And then the last is metrics. How do we keep people accountable throughout that? What are the things that we need to be looking at to keep people accountable? What I've recognized is that when an organization does those six things really well, it allows them to learn, earn, and return more effectively because it's there's a methodology and an intentionality behind it. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, and I'd love to have you go a little bit deeper too because this is something that we see small business owners struggle with. When, when do I try to do it myself? And when do I bring in a professional? And yeah. how do I know when to do that? How do I, of course, I mean, it's an issue of resources, right? Of, of paying someone uh, like a consultant, an independent contractor to do some of these things. But could you, could you speak to that a little bit more? Because that's, that's a pain point for a lot of business owners yeah, on can... various areas, you know, of their businesses and knowing, mm -hmm. oh, when, when is the right time to do this? How do I know? So uh, yeah, go into that if you would. So, so my wife and I, my, uh, my methodology is this. If I have someone on the team that has that skill set and they can do it at an eight, nine or 10, then we keep it in house. But if they can't do it at an eight, nine, or ten, then we look outside the house. It's a very just. It's kind of simple. So, like in an area right now that we're working on, there's a lot of things that I'm looking outside the house. And the reason is, is that I I don't believe we have the skill set in house to do it at a high level. So I'm bringing consultants in to help us with it in different areas, in technology, and HR, and finance, and marketing. So these are areas that I go outside, and then we have some people that are in-house to helping us with it. But that's really the methodology is that if, if we're going to grow, then we only grow in strengths. Strengths are eight, nines, and tens. So do we have eight, nines, and tens in that area in our company? If we do, then how can then we ask them to do it? But if they don't, then we will typically look for someone out, outside to help us. And it's a process, you know. You you don't you, you, as a small business owner, you have more vision than you have resources. It doesn't matter what small business it is. Every small business has a more vision than they have resources. And if someone's telling you that that's not the case, they're lying to you every time. So really, as a small business owner, the, 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 the key is, how do you use the resources most effectively to accomplish the purpose and the vision? And that's why the business model alignment is so key, because when you're real clear on what the purpose is and what the visions are and the values are, then you can start building giftedness. And if the giftedness is not in-house, then you look out-house. 
Okay. So let's say you are a, a solopreneur at this point, Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you're just building your business. You don't have the resources yet. And so there are things that you are having to learn, right? So, but there are things that you also know you're not great at. What, what can that solopreneur do? What can they plan for as far as, you know, building that ability to bring in those people to help grow the business? And I wish I would have thought of, I wish I would have looked at this 20 years ago, this way. I didn't. But remember, leadership is not leadership is not going back and beating yourself up for what you didn't know. It's taking what you know and using it for a brighter future, right? So knowing what I know today, Jenny, I would have figured out what I was really good at much earlier on in my career. It probably didn't happen until about seven years ago. I really started to understand what I was really good at. I, I would have I would have figured that out sooner. And the reason why I say that, especially with like a solopreneur, is because in the beginning when you're starting, every decision matters. It's really in I hate to say it, but it really is the difference between the success and the failure of the business. I wish I would have learned what my strength was sooner. So then I would have been able to spend more time focused in that and then find someone else. This, When you're a solopreneur, your first hire is your most important decision you're going to make. And if you don't know what you're good at, then how could you hire someone and, and hire them and what they're good at? Because those two, you need to be able to complement each other working together in the model. And like I said earlier, most, almost every business I know has more vision than they have resources. So, so if the vision is bigger than what you financially can afford, you need to make sure you're using strengths. So that would be my, that would be my recommendation is that if you're a solopreneur, find out what you're really good at. We, we have a leadership assessment we use that helps that. So it really simplifies it. So instead of spending three years, you can find out literally in one hour with a session with one of our coaches. And it really helps really narrow down what your giftedness is. But then how do you spend more time in that area? Because a lot of the times it's a mispriorities is the reason why the company doesn't grow. It's not because it's not because it's not possible. It's because you're putting energy and time towards the things that you think is a priority instead of the thing that actually is a priority. Okay, so that begs the question then, how do you set those priorities? How do you get clear on those priorities? Yep, you, you, you become real clear on purpose, vision, values, gift, and strategy metrics. Because the clearer you are on that, that then allows you to be very clear on what your priorities are. So I'll give you an example. Because I'm clear on that in Lion's Pride, there are things that I'm not willing to do that 10 years ago, I would have been doing half of the day. Not, not because I'm better, not because I'm too good. It's just, I know what I'm good at now and I know where I add the greatest value. And because I know that, I don't want to get out of that. Because then what I do is I rob my team members of greater potential opportunities for their future because I'm operating not in something that's a strength of mine. So I know speaking for me is, is, is one of the ways I add the most value to people. I also know it's how we bring in opportunities. I know it's how I'm able to add value to our key relationships like you guys at the SBDC, right? If I don't do this because I wanna spend time in something else, Well, it doesn't add value to you. It doesn't add value to us. And it actually hurts us from growing. So as a a solopreneur, as a business leader, we need to really know what we're good at. And that's what our leadership assessment, it really helps with becoming very clear on what you're really good at, what you're passionate about, what you're competent at. Thank you. And I want to mention, uh, Chad does have a free resource on his site which uh, goes over those six parts of the business model alignment. So I dropped that link in the chat. If you do want to go snag that and, uh, you know, have that to reflect on. 
Yeah. Uh, so they can, so to that point, Jenny, they can really print that out and start taking notes and using it as a brainstorming session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Of course. And mm -hmm. uh, so we did have a, a thank you come in in the chat. This person has been reading your book and they said it's taking them to a deeper level of understanding and they are uh, starting to plan out implementation of several concepts for their company. So they wanted to send that thanks in to you. Um, so something, awesome. yes, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> something else that I would love to have you comment on is so in that mentorship process, you talked about being a leader, helping others. When you get to that point of others becoming the leaders and then helping, you know, person B, helping person C. Step four to five. Step four to five. What can a small business owner do to encourage that kind of culture where you know, when they bring people on, it's with the expectation that they're going to learn, they're going to grow, and then they're going to help others learn and grow within the organization. Uh, because that's something that people don't always uh, have from the get-go with employment. Mm -hmm. And so how do you build a culture in, in your own small business to promote that type of, of model? Yeah, I, I'm going to be real with you right now, Jenny. I'm going to be totally real. If you're, if, if as a business owner, you're not constantly trying to grow, you can't have that culture. I'm going to tell you the reason why you can't have that culture. If you're not constantly looking for opportunities, if you're not constantly trying to figure out ways to grow, develop more relationships, more networks, reach more people, grow the business, scale the business. What happens is, is the business becomes a lid to your people on your team's future growth. Because if the business is not growing, then people are not going to train people to develop them because they're not going to be needed. Just hear me out for a moment. If, if your business, let's just use Danielle and I as the leaders of Lions Pride Leadership. If we're saying, well, we're just going to stay status quo. We're just going to work on what we're doing. Then why would any one of my team want to train someone to replace them? Because there's no future growth for them. See, most businesses want that level of growth process, that five-step process. They would love to have more leaders, but the business leader, the owner, the, the person leading the ship is not taking, not constantly figuring out how does this organization keep growing. So the business becomes a lid to people wanting to develop a replacement for themselves because they can't see if I replace myself, where am I growing in the organization? There's no more room for potential there. That's one issue. The second issue is, is people, most companies compensate people to produce rather than reproduce. Don't shoot me down because I'm sharing real well. Most companies pay people to produce, do the work instead of reproduce, help other people figure out how to do it. So when you take those two things, if, if those are the two things that you're not working through as a business leader, then it's going to be very hard to have that five-step mentoring process built into your culture. Because if you're not constantly growing, and if you're not paying, if, if, if you're not rewarding people to say, hey, you could develop more people. Most people are not going to train a replacement if they don't think that they can grow in the company, if they can take a higher level position, if they can have more compensation. So they will not develop people because then if they develop people, they lose their influence or they lose their position. So those two things really have to be worked out. It's constantly why I'm always pushing ourselves to grow because I don't I, like I don't want people on my team in 20 years from now to be the same in the same position. If they're in the same position, I failed them. Well, Chad, we are at time today. Thank you for these insights. Very a, a lot of food for thought for small business owners who are with us today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, Q&A session. Thank you to everyone who has been here and contributed to today's conversation. We appreciate you. Remember that you will get a link to the recording in a follow-up email coming up very shortly. And our next session 
will be next week, so June 26th at noon, and this will be our last session of this series. But mm -hmm. you will uh, have all these recordings that you will be able to come back and reference as you uh, continue looking at how you can implement some of these things that uh, Chad has taught us into your business. So uh, I do also want to uh, mention that we have our own, the NYSBDC survey that will show up once I close down this webinar. And so uh, if you are able to spend just a few minutes filling that out, we do always love to hear participant feedback and know what other topics you would like to see training from the New York Small Business Development Center on. And uh, so Chad, any last words for our attendees today? No, nope. I just want to, Jenny, I want to thank you and, and the team at the SBDC for all you do. And uh, thank you. Appreciate you guys. It's our pleasure. And there, there are thanks coming in uh, in the mm -hmm. chat. If you want to take a look at those really quick, Chad, and uh, a, a, <laughs> a suggestion for another series. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We're glad no. that you've been enjoying this one <laughs> and uh, getting value out of it, as, as Chad likes to talk about uh, giving value. So we're glad that this has given value to you, and I'm glad to be a part of it. All right, yeah. everyone, have a lovely rest of your Juneteenth day, and we will see you next week, we hope, for our final session of this series. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, guys.